Great. Um, well, thank you, uh, Joaquin and uh, Srini, for the invitation. I know Srini couldn't be here, but I think he's with us virtually. So if you're here, maybe he'll pop in over the, the speakers. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, a project we've been working on, trying to extract information about galaxy formation. And we even touched a little bit on cosmology in this um, using uh, CMB surveys. In particular, I'll show you some, some results, some recent results, maybe not so recent results. They're like a year or two old. Um, from ACT, um, showing sort of the power that we have and will have going forward in the cosmic microwave background uh, and the secondary anisotropies of the cosmic microwave background. So I wasn't told uh, exactly what the level of the seminar should be, so I'm going to give a little bit of background. If you've already heard it, that's OK. Then you can just nod along with me. Um, but you know, over the past, say, 20, 30 years, we've made uh, lots of progress in understanding how galaxies form, right? Here's a really nice image from JWST looking at a galaxy cluster, and you're able just to see galaxies all the way back to, some people even claim, out to Redshift 17. I don't know if I believe those yet. But, you know, this gives us an idea of, you know, how galaxies are, you know, evolving over time, right? We can't sit around and watch a galaxy evolve. That's way too many graduate student lifetimes to actually see a galaxy go uh, and change, even rotate. Um, so what we have is just snapshots of galaxies over time. Um, and a lot of this has been done just looking at the stellar properties of galaxies, right? You look at your Hubble deep fields, now we have our JWST deep fields, right? And you can try and piece together how things change, how the luminosity function is changing over time, how the morphology of galaxies are changing over time, et cetera, et cetera, the star formation rates. So this is where a lot of work has been um, and where a lot of progress has been made, right? Uh, and the, you know, the problem we're trying to solve, right, is to go from initial conditions like what we have in the cosmic microwave background, right, these density fluctuations, which we see in temperature fluctuations in the photons, to the galaxies and potentially even the larger structures like galaxy clusters that we see today, right? And if I were to give you a pen and paper, you could not sit down and write out how this, how this works, right? This process here, these arrows are inherently nonlinear, right? So you can't actually sit down and write down an analytic formula for how to go from these initial density fluctuations to what we see today, right? So, you know, even in the simplest case, let's say we wanted to just ignore stars and go from these density fluctuations to just the density fluctuations we see today, like in, say, a galaxy, right? Not forgetting, uh, trying to, you know, solve the physics for how stars form and things like that, right? That process itself, the collapse under gravity, is not a spherical collapse like what you may have been taught in your graduate cosmology class, right? That collapse inherently goes nonlinear once you have multiple crossings, right, in your, in your collapse. Therefore, you need uh, simulations in order to, you know, just even just capture what gravity is doing from these initial fluctuations to what we see today. Right, so here's our initial conditions, right, I and mean, it's very simple. We can, we can do this, maybe people do this here, right, where you set up a simulation, you give it some initial conditions, you turn on gravity, and you watch structure form, right? And you know, structure forms hierarchically, so you'll see small things start to form first. They will merge. As they merge over time, they will form larger things. You'll see things first collapse in one dimension, forming what used to be called Zeldovich pancakes. Then you'll form filaments. And eventually, you collapse in all three dimensions, and you'll see these very, you'll see this uh, web like structure. And at the nodes of these webs, you'll see very massive things like galaxy clusters and and along those, along those filaments and structure like that, you'll see various galaxies, right? And so we have a fairly good understanding of how, you know, structure forms just gravitationally, right? We can take initial conditions and we can form the structure, the overall large scale structure that we see today via just, you know, n body simulations, right? So this is just an example of something that was done, you know, 15 years ago. Um, this is work led by Volker Springo, right? So you can see the galaxy clusters here. You can also see regions where there's voids. 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a very thin slice of our universe, right? You can imagine if we integrated this over a very large volume, uh, as, as, as we're taught in our cosmology classes, the universe is, is uniform, uh, or essentially uniform, right? Homogeneous and isotropic. This is a very narrow slice, therefore we can see this, this structure here. Okay, so we can solve how just the basic, you know, halos, how gravity, um, you know, collapses, uh, you know, how structure collapses over time. But that doesn't actually work for galaxies, right? So here, in this red line here, I'm showing you basically the mass function, or the halo mass function. So this tells you the abundance of galaxies, or the abundance of galaxies or halos as a function of mass, right? And so you can see over here on this axis, this is basically abundance. So as we go to lower mass things, you get a lot more collapsed halos. When you get to higher mass things, they become much rarer, right? And you can imagine if everything was just dominated by gravitational collapse, then the luminosity function of these galaxies, or galaxy clusters, or halos would look exactly the same. And what I'm showing you in blue is roughly the shape of the Schechter function, right? And so the Schechter function says, well, it doesn't actually match at this high mass end. There's actually a lot less luminous structure than you'd expect if they matched one to one to, say, uh, collapsed objects uh, gravitationally. And at the, at the low mass end as well, there's sort of a deficit of these, uh, you know, deficit of bright galaxies. Uh, not bright, well, there's a deficit of galaxies at the, at the lower luminosity end as well. So there's something that's going on here at these two ends that don't match. Yes? Uh, why do integrals mismatch? Hmm? total number of galaxies. Is it for purpose? So this, is, this is as a function of luminosity. So the Schechter function is a function. The other one's a function of mass. So they don't, they don't have to add up, right? Yeah, sure. They, they don't have to add up because we have a lot of mass out of galaxies. So my question is, do we have in our simulations more mass in galaxies or more luminosity in galaxies than we observe? Um, so the, let me kind of answer that question. So this isn't trying to map mass to mass. This is saying if we have collapsed objects and there's nothing else going on besides just gravity collapsing these objects, then the luminosity right, of those objects should roughly match their mass. That's all it's saying. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a statement about conservation of mass or anything like that. So this, this is what this is trying to show is that there's some sort of additional physics going on that's sort of suppressing the, the abundance of, say, star formation here and star formation here. So it's not just pure gravitational collapse, right, in the simplest case. Does that, does that help uh, answer your question? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Sorry, once again. So we have some mass in galaxies, mm -hmm. which is luminous, yeah, by stars, and we have some mass in clusters and whatever, yeah? So do our observations match with predictions uh, to this ratio of masses in, gal in stars and not in stars? Uh, yes. I mean, barren mass, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you were to go and, say, look at, say, the high mass end and say, where are the, where are the baryons in, say, galaxy clusters? Yeah, we have simulations, we have measurements that sort of match what we'd expect there to be, say, for the abundance of dark matter, the abundance of hot gas, the abundance of stars in these, in these objects. Right. So often what people do here is they invoke sort of feedback processes that make things like star formation at the high mass end and the low mass end, high luminosity end, low luminosity end, not match. Right. So on the high mass end, they often invoke things like AGN feedback, so feedback from active galactic nuclei at the center of these objects. And at the low mass end, they say, well, this is going to be feedback from, say, stellar winds, supernova, et cetera, happening on, on, these, on these smaller masses. Right? And there seems to be a point where it doesn't actually matter, and this is roughly around sort of the L star of, or just below the L star of our, our Milky Way. Okay? And so this motivates people who run large cosmological simulations to put these sort of models in for, say, feedback from stars and from AGN. So this is a, a suite, not an entire suite, of uh, examples of 
many, many CPU hours, lots of lots of energy used to run these simulations, um, where they try and recreate sort of the stellar properties of galaxies. And to do that, they invoke these various uh, feedback models, both at the high mass end, invoking things like AGN feedback, and at the low mass end, where they invoke things like stellar feedback. Now, uh, the key thing here is, though, these models aren't uh, from first principles, right? They, it's really hard for somebody to run a cosmological simulation, you know, where you're simulating scales of hundreds of megaparsecs and trying to resolve things down on the order of an AU, right, which you'd need for star formation or even for accretion onto a black hole, right? So these simulations invoke what's called subgrid feedback models to try and capture the physics of what's going on below the resolution of the simulation, okay? And they actually have been, I would say, very successful, especially in the past you know, five to 10 years in reproducing the stellar properties of galaxies. Um, so two examples here, here's the Eagle simulation showing you a nice Hubble tuning fork diagram, right? Here is the illustrious collaboration showing you their nice disk galaxies, their elliptical galaxies, their irregular galaxies, and they roughly produce the right number of said disk galaxies and uh, elliptical galaxies in these simulations. Which is, which is really nice. Um, the problem, or a problem, is that these simulations, because of these various subgrid feedback models, have lots of knobs you can turn. So the question is, have you actually learned anything, or have you just done sort of like a fine tuning problem where you've run a bunch of simulations, twisted a bunch of knobs in your simulations until you've you know, adjusted a couple parameters, until you got the result that you wanted? Like, what, what have you actually learned? And, What's kind of nice is because these simulations are essentially, or at least for the most part, tuned to produce the stellar properties, if you look at the properties of the gas in these galaxies, and I'm not talking like molecular gas, I'm talking the ionized, the hot ionized gas around these galaxies, um, you can, they've actually made predictions. And so that's something that's, that's really nice, and that's something that we're going to use uh, here. So they've made predictions for what the circumgalactic medium should look like. Okay, they're not actually tuned to these simulation, uh, these these particular observations. For the most part, sometimes there's some tuning at the high mass end, but on the scales of galaxies, there's no real uh, statistical observations of the circumgalactic medium um, on scales that they could actually resolve. So. That's, that's really nice. The, the circumgalactic medium here is the gas surrounding the galaxy, right? This is the reservoir of baryons, which would potentially fall back onto the galaxy or potentially have been shot out of the galaxy in a galactic fountain. So this is your reservoir of baryons that could potentially form stars over time. It also contains information of any sort of feedback processes, right? You can imagine if there was some sort of central engine blowing gas out via an AGN, this would blow you know, this gas out into the circumgalactic medium. This medium is relatively hot. It takes a long time to cool. So this CGM contains, you know, has a memory of the processes that have gone on in these galaxies, right? And this is where a majority of the baryons are, right? They're also not in the stars. So this is a great place to probe uh, you know, these, these sort of processes which we invoke to understand galaxy formation. Places, this is a great way to probe things like feedback. And the way, as given away in the title, the way I think one of the neat ways we can start to do this now is by using secondary anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background. In particular, I think the SZ effect, both the thermal and kinetic, are well tuned to do this. Um, and we can do it, we can't do it for individual galaxies, like you say you could potentially do with absorption line measurements through the CGM, but you can do it statistically, which as a cosmologist, I like to do things statistically. So what we're going to use is the cosmic microwave background, right? So we've already, we already talked about this, right? We're seeing temperature fluctuations um, from redshift 1100, right? These are initially quantum fluctuations that have been blown up by potentially something like inflation. Uh, and these are the seeds that, that you know, source the structure that has grown today. Um, 
But we're not going to use it like this. We're not going to use it in its traditional sense to study sort of those initial fluctuations, study the properties of the primordial plasma that produced, uh, that helped grow these fluctuations over time. Right? We're going to use it as a uniform backlight because these fluctuations are roughly on the order of 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 4. Right? To us, the CMB, at least to me, is a fairly uniform backlight that we know very well. We know that temperature very well. So we're going to use these photons from this uniform backlight to illuminate the circumgalactic medium. Okay? So here's a, a movie from Planck. Hopefully there's no sound, otherwise you hear Charles Lawrence. Um, and what it's going to show is that the, the journey of a CMB photon, so here it is, coupled in its primordial plasma before recombination, and then what you'll see is these electrons and protons all of a sudden recombine, and these photons, you can see bouncing off the electrons, won't have anything to scatter off of, right? And they will start free streaming towards us. Here we go, here's our photon, this one. Um, and as you'll see, over time, this photon will lose energy as it's going through our expanding universe, right? And that's going to be uh, shown here in the color change, right? We went from blue, now we're going to green. You'll see this photon get deflected by structure in the universe, right? Via gravitational lensing. So here it is getting bent. You'll see it continuing on through the universe. It's going to interact with a hot electron and gain some energy. This is the thermal Sinyazeldovich effect, and it will continue on towards our galaxy and happen to fall right into the Planck satellite. As we go, see it's getting redder and redder. We'll just wait. No, I have nothing more to say. There, it got captured by Planck. OK? So that is the journey of some photons through our universe, right? Um, that, that scattering, oh, we don't need to see that. That scattering effect that I showed you happens to roughly about 6% of those photons, right? And so what it is, is we have this uniform backlight that can illuminate all this structure here via things like that, via gravitational lensing, via SC effects, et cetera, et cetera. And it can help probe things like how structure grows, how, uh, you know, the CGM. It's even in a very nice probe of reionization, um, all of which I've worked on, but I can't talk about everything here. So. What we're going to use, I'm going to talk about um, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, or ACT, which is a you know, reasonably high-resolution CMB experiment in the Atacama Desert. It's high, it's dry, not necessarily as dry as the pole, but you get to see more of the sky, which, if you're doing cross-correlation measurements, is, is ideal. Okay? So it's a little higher than ALMA, um, but ALMA is somewhere down here on the plane. Right? And what high resolution gets you is a couple things, right? Um, you get to see, so here's the same piece of sky. This is a very old plot. Um, where, so here's WMAP, here's Planck, here's ACT and SBT. This is what the sky looks like between the, between the three of them, right? And you can start to see structures start to pop out, things like point sources, things like galaxy clusters. Via This is, you're looking at the thermal SC decrement here, right? So this is, this is really nice. Just to sort of hammer it home, here's a really nice, uh, movie made by Sigurd Ness showing you ACT over here. We're scanning across. Here's Planck, right? And you can just see the difference between the two going from, uh, you know, poor resolution to higher resolution. You really see stuff start to pop out. You can even see things like galaxy clusters by eye, where these, where some of these decrements. So you can see some point sources. These are things Joaquin's interested in. There's a decrement. Well, Are you sure ACT can detect clusters? Not according. There's one right there. <laughs> I'm just doing it by eye. This is just a narrow patch of the sky. Yeah, we can see clusters. And we see them via the, the thermal SC effect. So what is the thermal SC effect? Well, as you saw in the movie, right, we have our CMB photon come in. And some of them can interact with uh, free electrons, hot free electrons. And what happens is they're inverse Compton scattered. right, And that means they gain some energy. Now, the electrons don't care. The electrons have much higher energy than these CMB photons, so they don't really see these, see these photons come in. But what it does is it distorts the CMB black body. So you get a deficit of photons at lower energy and an excess at higher energies. Okay? This is just the basic non-relativistic thermal SC effect. There are relativistic corrections. There's also the non-thermal 
uh, uh, Sinai's Ladovich effect. But this is just the basic one. This is the one that we see the most. Uh, this is the brightest effect that we can see. And this, uh, this distortion, the spectral distortion in the, in the background, right? its amplitude is proportional to the integrated pressure here. It depends on the density of these free electrons and the temperature of those free electrons. Okay, so it's integrated line of sight pressure gives you the, the amplitude of the thermal density, right? These electrons can also be moving, right? And so if they're moving, you can think of them like a moving mirror and they can actually Doppler boost these CMB photons, right? So if you have free electrons with a peculiar velocity with respect to the cosmic microwave background or the, the Hubble expansion, right? You can get a boost again or, or a, a deficit depending on which way these electrons are moving, right? So this is a Doppler boost. And this Doppler boost is known as the kinematic or kinetic Sinyazl-Dovich effect. And that's proportional to the line of sight momentum, right? So basically your density, how, well, how good of a moving mirror you are, and the velocity of, the, of those, the peculiar velocity of those electrons, right? And that, to first order, actually has no spectral distortion. It looks exactly like a black body just shifted to a different temperature. Okay, so here is an example of the thermal signal of right? Here's your spectral distortion. Here's your Compton Y parameter. This is your integrated pressure along the line of sight. Here's our CMB fluctuation, right? And here we put a galaxy cluster in front of it, and you can see larger deficit at lower frequencies, right? We get a null at 217, or roughly 220, and then an excess here at uh, 300 gigahertz. Right? Here's the Here's the kinematic, the kinetic SC, right? And again, it's just showing you it's the integral of these line of sight electrons, and it's just, just showing you potentially how you could get these peculiar velocities, right? If you have two galaxies that are attracted to one another, they will have peculiar velocities um, with respect to the Hubble flow towards each other, right? And so the one moving away from us will give us a cooler CMB spot, right? And the one moving towards us will give us a hotter CMB spot, okay? So, so that's, that's really nice. Um, you can think of it as, at least the kinetic, as being measuring, measuring two things, two quantities, right? You can measure the optical depth. You can measure the density of these photons, or sorry, the density of these electrons, or their peculiar velocity, right? And the peculiar velocity will be a function of, say, their distance away from one another. This will be like your velocity correlation function. And the density will roughly represent sort of a density profile. That's how this uh, kinematic, kinetic SZ can be broken down. And so you can do two things, right? You can do cosmology by looking at the velocity. There's lots of cosmological information in your velocity correlation function, right? Or you can look at astrophysics, right? And look at the density profile of these free electrons. Okay, so there's two essentially different measurements, and you have to try and disentangle the two, right? So you get both astrophysics and cosmology in the measurement, and you have to decide or choose an estimator in order to sort of extract one or the other, right? And there's been uh, an emergence of these measurements of the kinetic SZ. This was much harder to measure than the thermal SZ, partially because you can't just go out and stack on galaxies. Right, your peculiar velocity is parity odd. Right, things are most are just as likely to be moving away from us as they are towards us. I think I hit the mic. Um, that's what that was. So you can't just take galaxies and stack them up. You should get a null result unless there's a mean bulk motion of the universe in one particular direction, um, which there isn't. Um, even though I think maybe like 10 years ago there was some claims that there was. I think Planck put that to rest. So there's no. We're not. We're not moving to the left. Or the right. OK, good. So you have to come up with more interesting estimators, right, to try and disentangle and get at this thermal SC, or sorry, kinetic SC effect, right? So that's what people have been doing with various different data sets, various different estimators. This is just a gallery. I'm not going to talk about them. I'm going to talk particularly about one that I'm interested in because it gets at the astrophysics. So this is basically a velocity reconstruction estimator where you take a cosmic microwave background map, and you weight it by the expected velocity of that galaxy that you're stacking on. Okay, And this velocity is a reconstructed velocity. It's the same thing people do for baryonic acoustic oscillations. 
right? You basically say, you look at, on large scales, right, the density is going to be sourcing the velocity, right? If you remember back to just how your, your linear structure growth in your cosmology class. So therefore, you should be able to go backwards and say, aha, given the density of the objects here, they've come from over here. Therefore, on linear scales, they should be, they're, they're moving this, this way. Right? So that's how this particular estimator is set up. So you cross-correlate your velocity estimation with your cosmic microwave background. And what that gives you is an RMS velocity, so just an overall V squared right, for, your, for your galaxies, which we actually know. You can calculate this directly from cosmology. Right? And so this doesn't depend on scale. And then, because you're getting a V squared here, right? Because if you're looking at a particular distortion, this distortion is going to go like V times density, right? For your kinetic SZ. So you get a V squared term here, and you're going to get the optical depth. And if you do this as a function of aperture size, right, you can get a density profile. So given this estimator, you can go and measure things like a cumulative density profile, which was first shown by Sean and Ferraro and the ACT collaboration. Oh, eight years ago, or seven, six years ago, six years ago. This estimator was proposed several years before that um, by Shirley Ho and Chris Harada and David Spurgel. Um, and yeah, this was the first measurement. And we've now since updated this, right? Sorry, Nick, on the, I kind of got lost. These are, is this with galaxies or clusters right now? Galaxies. This is individual galaxies, OK. So you're taking galaxies, you're doing a velocity reconstruction, and you're stacking a whole bunch of them up. Yeah, the, the scale. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so this is arc minutes uh, here, right? Uh, and this is meant to show you sort of the viral radius of those galaxies. So these are C-mass galaxies. So they're like smallish groups, 10 to the 13 solar mass halos. Right, so, you know, Measuring the kinetic SC, that's the hard part. The TSC we basically get for free. We've been measuring the TSC for forever since Gil was a graduate student. Um, so that's forever ago. Um, so we have pressure and, and density for objects, which is really nice, right? There was a paper um, or a couple papers in the early 2000s talking about, well, if we had measure, simultaneous measurements of galaxy clusters if, with the kinetic SC and the thermal SC, we can start to decompose things into temperature, their optical depth, their peculiar velocity. And this is something, actually, we're trying to do now with the, the, the Fred Young Similimeter Telescope. I'll mention that later. But this was a really neat way to look at sort of individual objects. Um, the way we've been thinking about it is if you have pressure and density, right, you have things like temperature. You have basically the full thermodynamic information of these objects. So you can actually turn it around and say, if we're doing this on galaxy scales, then we have basically the full thermodynamic information to look at how the galaxy formation or what, what the physical processes have done um, to these galaxies and the CGM going forward. Yes? Ah, good. So this, this was a measurement of, just, just talking about this, this is just meant to be an example. Um, but x-ray measurements could play a, play a role here. Um, so this was an example of uh, measurements on galaxy clusters. So people have gone out on galaxy clusters and measured their temperature via the spectroscopic uh, temperature measurements you can get from, 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 from the x-rays, right? You can look at things like line widths and whatnot. Um, and then the, you can also measure the density, right? And so therefore, you can estimate what a pressure would be. And so they've done this for several galaxy clusters. So you can really do this on the, on the more massive objects. And then what Planck did was they said, well, let's look at these in the SC. And so they made their own uh, pressure profiles in the SC, uh, the thermal SC measurements. And they were trying to see how they matched up. Um, but in general, right, on galaxy scales, it becomes really, really hard to see x-rays. I think if you try and stack on, there's, there's some measurements of massive galaxies that have x-ray halos. Um, but trying to measure the CGM in x-rays is just really difficult. Uh, but it has been done on, on some special cases. But it does give you more information. And it's potentially something that could be done. I think people are looking into doing this with Erosita.
Yes. So those that Knox and Seagal, those papers weren't using the same mechanism that you're going to use, right? That's correct. You were on these papers. Um, so yeah, we were we're using that was done I think for like individual objects trying to trying to extract like KSC just by looking at the the spectrum basically, right? Here what we're doing is we're doing a, a very large cross correlation. So we have a sample of at least for this measurement CMAS galaxies from the BOSS survey, right? And then we have our ACT maps, and so you can see the overlap here in these regions between BOSS and and ACT. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a velocity reconstruction on the BOSS galaxies, use those velocities to then weight our, our measurements, uh, or, or weight our cross correlations with the cosmic microwave background uh, uh, data from ACT, and that will give us our density profiles. Or we don't weight them at all, and that should give us our thermal SC, right? So that's the way it works. So we're going to do both using the same data set of galaxies, we're going to use the velocity weighting in one case and not use the velocity weighting in the other case, right, so to get the thermal and kinetic. So here are the galaxies. I forgot there was a movie. Um, and then it, this is going to show you the velocity reconstruction. You'll see blue and red. So blue being towards us, red being away from us. So you can see, see there's very large coherent lengths too in the velocity. Um, so that's why you get these sort of, you know, uh, leopard-like patterns, these spots. So here's the measurement. Here's, here's our act. Uh, so here's the measurement in the millimeter. Right Here's the gas density. You can kind of see it. Uh, it helps it when you, when you stack uh, and, do your, and you average over annuli. Right Here's the gas pressure. Um, this is the void. We have projected out dust. Here it is with the dust. You can see this nice little donut. Right, And that dust is coming from basically the central regions of the, of the galaxy, right, where you have lots of gas and dust for things like star-forming galaxies, right? So you can see we measure the gas well beyond uh, things like the virial radius uh, way, way out, which is kind of nice. So we get this transition regime, too, from the circumgalactic medium into the intergalactic medium. Okay, so here is the measurement of the density profile, the cumulative density profile for the CMAS galaxies, right? Here is the virial, roughly the virial radius. Um, I think that's being convolved with the, the beam that we have. So roughly showing you, we have a couple elements inside the virial radius of these galaxies and then well out into the uh, intergalactic medium, okay? Um, this measurement, if you were to say you know, how significant it is, you can quantify in several different ways. One of the ways we see, like, how much are we seeing this over a null result, right? So it's roughly, depending on exactly how you count, a six to eight sigma measurement of the kinetic SC in galaxies, which was the highest, I think it still is the highest signal to noise KC measurement on these mass scales, right? Um, and then you could also ask the question, well, does the gas look like the dark matter? We know the answer is no, right? Gas feels pressure, but this shows that Here's what the dark matter profile would look like, you know, with making some choices, exactly how massive these galaxies are, et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't look like the NFW profile to like 90 sigma. Yes? Um, did you guys select uh, the galaxies based on known outflows or like known uh, AGN? No, these like are just the CMAS sample of galaxies that happen to fall within the footprint. Um, but we can start to, and one of the things I'll mention is going forward, the significance of these measurements is going to go way, way up. So we can start to do sub-selections on these galaxy samples, um, which would be really neat to, to do. Right? And you can choose your favorite subsample. right? You could say, ah, these galaxies look like they have outflows. Let's look at those compared to ones that don't. Let's look at galaxies in denser environments versus less dense environments. You get to choose right? once we have more and more galaxies. Yeah? The, the original hill result was that three and a half sigma. Am I recalling that correctly? Which hill? The original detection of KSC with pairwise. The handed all yes. results. The handed all results were four sigma, four-ish sigma, and at the time. Yeah, but so the data sets have gotten way, way better, and 
and like I get systematic errors, but um, can you just walk us through like um, what you guys learned about systematics and why? Yeah, we learned that the covariances weren't properly calculated in the hand at all result. <laughs> Was one of the things we learned. Uh, this is being recorded. Uh, we can turn it off. And no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, we, so we actually redid. So the hand at all result was a different estimator than this. Okay. Um, so that's using this pairwise estimator. Gil's shaking his head. It shouldn't really make a difference. It, 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 it turns out we did it with an updated data set and basically got the same significance. And then we tried to reproduce the hand at all result. And if we use the same sort of techniques, the hand at all result looked more like a one-ish two-ish sigma measurement. Um, okay. So, so we, we, we potentially underestimated our error bars in the first, in the first result. Yeah, but it's but still there. But what was the, what's the source of the systematic? The source of the systematic? Um, it was just a miscalculation of the covariance matrix. Okay. That's all it was. Okay. Right? That's going to lead to, if you underestimate your error bars, that's going to lead to a higher significance. Yeah, okay. The result looked the same. Like, we still got the same curve, just the you increase the error bars, your signal to noise goes down. Okay, but like the chi by i looks fine in the, with the old data set. But okay. Sure, but that's because your error bars are <laughs> correlated. Yeah. Um, yeah, chi by i, especially for the pairwise, are, is really, really tricky because there's a, there's a it's very correlated. Even these are correlated, right? Because you, you're doing aperture photometry, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's a cumulative result. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. right. So this looks much better than than it actually. You know, the error bars are actually small, but they're actually highly correlated, especially out here. The more you get out here too on these larger scales, the C and B is correlating these bins as well. Yeah. So you have C and B fluctuations that you're trying to beat down. And, and so with Desi, like looking five years from now, how much I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Okay. I'll get to that in 20 minutes. Looks like I won't have time to talk about cosmology. Uh, here's the, the thermal SE result. You can see it's, it's much higher. Um, this, it turns out, once you get to these you know, sort of much higher sensitivities, uh, higher, higher fidelity measurements, you really have to start to worry about, you probably did too at the lower fidelity measurements, you have to really worry about dust contamination in these, in these objects. Um, What's really nice, I said you have temperature, you have dense, sorry, you have pressure, you have density. Here's a pressure profile, or sorry, temperature profile. You basically just divide, you know, your pressure by your density. And this gives you a rough idea of what the temperature of these galaxies are. This is meant to show you what the expected virial temperature is for these galaxies, um, which is kind of neat. Uh, and so this is sort of the first time we have the temperature profile well out into the circumgalactic, uh, circumgalactic medium into the intergalactic medium. And then what you can do is you want to get. Yeah. Oh, wait, it's right here. Good. That's low, right? Compared to the virial temperature, yeah. But this is, here's the virial radius. You know, some, some uh, I mean, these are 10 to the 10 to the 13 solar mass objects. We don't really have temperature measurements there. This is sort of the first time, especially getting a temperature profile. Do we know, should it be the virial temperature? I don't know, there's gonna be some cooling going on. Uh, if you ask, I think if you were to ask simulators, they say this is too hot, and I'll show you why they'd say that in a second. So they actually get much cooler CGMs than what we're, what we're finding. Um, so we have these measurements, that's great. Ideally, what you wanna do is start to interpret them, right? You wanna compare them to um, various models of galaxy formation or simulation, right? So what we had to do here was come up with a way to actually model exactly what we were measuring, right? So we decided to use a forward model approach where you take some theoretical profile, right? You project it along the line of sight, you convolve it with the beam of your experiment, right? And then you do aperture photometry on it. You treat it exactly like you do the, the, the observations, starting from some theory prediction, right? So this is uh, a pipeline that was developed by uh, uh, Stefania Amodio, who's now a staff scientist over in Strasbourg, 
uh, working with me, where we came up with a full forward model for the measurements that we're seeing in these cross correlations, right? And so then all you need to do is change this initial entry, right, your, your initial theory result, and you can go through and start extracting interesting information. Um, and this, though, this choice, there's, there's several choices you can make here for your initial theory input, uh, and those choices actually matter, right? So in particular, if you want to compare against simulations and you want to compare against a stack measurement, you have to make sure that whatever you're putting in to that stack, that initial theory calculation, is representative of what's in the actual data set. So if you have, say, a mass distribution of galaxies that you're stacking on, you want to include that mass distribution. If you have a redshift distribution, you want to model that redshift distribution. Otherwise, you can get various biases, which is what a graduate student who's working with me, Emily Mosier, has shown here in this paper, sort of the different biases you'd get. Looking at the same data, but you make different assumptions where one of them is the truth, this red curve is the truth. And if you make different assumptions or don't include things like uh, the fact that there'll be other galaxies around these galaxies that you're stacking on, so you'll get like a two halo term, et cetera, et cetera, that you would get biased results, right? So that's shown here just in these different posteriors that you have to be really careful that you're recreating to the best of your abilities that subsample that you are doing this cross correlation with. Okay, um, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over this, but we also had a model that uh, we, we wrote up a model, an old model, um, for sort of how the gas should distribute itself in galaxy clusters, and we applied this to groups, um, and there are two basically additional parameters in this, in this model, which basically tells you about the energy injected into the gas, and the amount of non-thermal pressure you have in that gas, say from turbulence, magnetic fields, cosmic rays, et cetera. So it was a nice sort of uh, toy model for what's going on in the circumgalactic medium. And we placed some interesting constraints on this. Um, but I don't have, basically the summary is 30%, we measured roughly 30% energy injection of the total uh, total energy in the system or the binding energy of the system. So 30% of that has been injected into these, into these systems. And we put an upper limit on the amount of turbulence, non-thermal pressure in these systems at 20%. Okay, but the more, I think, more interesting thing we did was, or more relevant thing we did is we compared to simulations. So we took our forward model, we took, uh, profiles, density pressure profiles from simulations and compared them to our measurements shown here. So here's the KSC, here's the TSC. And you can see here the density is actually not so bad. These are highly correlated. The PTE for this is reasonable. It's like 0.15, right? So density is okay. So the simulations seem to produce the density of these, of these, you know, 10 to the 13 solar mass halos correctly. But comparing to the pressure, they actually underproduce the pressure, especially out here. So once they get out into the intergalactic medium, the intergalactic medium, according to our measurements, is much harder than what the simulations have produced. Yes? So fire doesn't really have like a big statistical sample um, to use. Uh, Eagles, we just didn't contact them to get the data. Um, but there has been somebody who has done a comparison with eagles after the fact. So it was a paper led by uh, Junhan Kim, I believe, out at Caltech. So he did this. He took our data. I was on the paper. Uh, he did this comparison with eagles as well. And they see the si similar things. Yeah. But, so we took TNG because it was easy and publicly available. <laughs> um, so you know, there's, there's some discrepancy here, and it's not completely clear um, if it's something in the simulations or maybe there's something we don't have in our modeling. We're, so we're, we've actually been looking into this quite a bit over the past year or so. Um, for people who think about things more in three dimensions, right, this is showing you the three-dimensional posterior of our, measure, of our measurement. Here's the average, and the band is meant to show you the range, right? Um, because we're doing an MCMC fit, we can produce these curves. And here's what the profiles look like in three dimensions. And this region here is the region that's actually projected onto the, on, into, these, into these measurements. 
right? So you can see clearly there's a deficit. So the, the dark blue is our measurements, right? And here are the models, both T and G, and then some old simulations I ran uh, way back in the day. Right, so there's, there's many things we're investigating. Uh, one of the interesting things that we've actually stumbled across is that maybe, you know, we're assuming uh, uh, that we know the masses of these CMAS galaxies exactly. Uh, and for the thermal SE, that's actually a, a big deal. The thermal SE roughly scales like the mass of these galaxies to the five thirds, right? So if you're off by a little bit in mass, you can be off by a lot uh, in your overall prediction for what this thermal SE signal should be. So we've been, we're starting to look into this, but it's looking like maybe if we're off by like 30% in mass, maybe we don't know the CMAS galaxy's mass to 30%. That's not completely crazy. This could actually reduce some of this potential tension. So we're going we're gonna to follow that up. There's a paper, again, being led by Emily, where she's looking into to all of this. What is the mass? The mass, the average mass of these galaxies is like 2 times 10 to the 13 solar masses. Uh, but they're in groups. So these are like the central, yeah. They're, they're LRGs. So yeah, some yeah, of them could be in groups. Some of them are very dense environments. And so all the, all the gas is the stuff around it, right? Yeah, and that's what we're measuring. Yeah. Uh, so. No, I'm just asking, like, your measurement is like the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then, but it sounds like your estimate of the galaxy is just the galaxy, not the halo it's in? No, it's the halo. So when we do this for simulations, right, we use the whole halo mass. Yeah, okay. Or you can say, well, maybe we don't know the halo mass very well, but we know the stellar mass well. Again, maybe we don't. <laughs> um, and you can, you can stack on, you can say, let's select by stellar mass in the simulations, but then that relies on the simulation getting the right halo mass to stellar mass correct and things like that. So there's you know, many things that we've looked into here. And you know, this is going to become, again, these are kinetic, kinetic SC here. Is, this is 8-ish you know, sigma measurement. This is like a 12-ish sigma measurement. And we're going to actually blow this out of the water. Right? So, so when you say you know the mass of the galaxies, what do you mean specifically? They, they, uh, there's been a stellar, well, there's been like a, uh, an I-band selection that you map to stellar mass, that you map to halo mass. That this, is, this is the, yeah, there's, there's um, some sort of, yeah, stellar mass to halo mass relation that's assumed and put into the catalog. Um, so yes. Because you? you just take the catalog. We just take the catalog, and then we say, this is what the mass distribution is from the catalog. Let's use that. From like the I band magnitudes? For, yeah, so this could vary by a factor of two. So saying things are off by like 30%, saying things are off by 30% isn't completely crazy. Yeah, okay, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. But for the first pass, we just took, the, took them as is, yeah. took them at their word. Um, there's going to be, so this is just showing sort of the, what, what ACT has been doing. ACT is now uh, not observing, it's actually being taken apart. Um, but going forward, there's going to be new data from Chile on the sky. Um, and there's also going to be new spectroscopic surveys on the sky. So I wanted to just spend some time sort of showing you what's going to happen in the future. So there's the uh, Fred Young Similimeter Telescope, also called FIST, not FIST, um, that's even higher uh, than ACT. So it's at 5,600 meters. So you actually have much better transmission at these higher frequencies, which is very key for measuring things like CIB or measuring dust properties and things like that. So this is going to be a real workhorse in terms of you know, measuring these higher frequencies, being able to remove things like the cosmic infrared background from our future measurements, um, as well as doing many other interesting things, studying you know, uh, clouds within our galaxies, looking at dust properties of those clouds, magnetic fields, um, potentially trying to measure Rayleigh scattering, uh, I don't know. There's a whole bunch of things. We have a whole science book that um, I don't have time to talk about. There's also the Simons Observatory, which should be on the sky in 2023. Um, this should be on the sky about six months later. So these are well linked. You'll notice that the telescope is exactly the same. There's the same telescope, Simons Observatory, at least a large aperture telescope from the Simons Observatory. But this is going to be roughly at the axe site, or exactly the axe site. Um, so it's going to be a little lower, focusing on lower frequencies. So there's a lot of complementarity between these two experiments. 
uh, and then there's CMBS4, uh, and in the spirit of Gill, this is an old table, but I refuse to update it because <laughs> uh, if you were in the discussion this morning, it's just too much lag. There's no need. Um, but there's CMBS4, which is going to be like Simon's Observatory, um, but with more telescopes, more detectors on the sky. Again, lowering the noise in our CMB maps, which is going to help a lot. And, you know, Looking ahead, we went ahead and wrote this white paper that made it into the decadal, that made it into these cosmic ecosystems, and actually highlighted the fact that CMBS4 will be great for studying these cosmic ecosystems. Uh, and this is just showing you sort of the explosion in signal to noise. Don't, don't look too much into, you know, we've passed this. We haven't gotten to, you know, KSC measurements of 100 yet, but there's some potentially floating around, maybe. Um, I don't think we're going to make this mark. But this is well enough in the future that we may make, you know, 500 sigma measurements of the KSC going forward. Yeah, so one thing I learned from writing this paper is if you're going to make predictions like this, you do it for like 10 years in advance. <laughs> you don't do it for a couple years after this thing is going to come out. Um, but what's, what's really nice is the thermal and kinetic SC, they don't care really roughly what redshift you're at. There's no real redshift dependence. You know, x-rays are going to fall off. Uh, fast radio bursts could be limited by things like scattering to very, very high redshifts. Uh, absorption lines, you need, you need, you need a lot of, uh, of background quasars or galaxies to try and do this. For kinetic SC, all you need is a sample of objects, right? So if you have a large enough sample of objects, the CMB is far enough back that, you know, there's no real redshift uh, dependence here, right? It's, it's, a, it's a scattering effect. Um, so, you know, you don't have this cosmological dimming, things like that. So we can go out, pretty much probe anything as long as we have a sample that's large enough um, to do this. So this was meant to illustrate that. Uh, um, this were, these were some forecasts I did before, showing you roughly what the size of those error bars would be on things like the density and, and pressure profile. Um, here's going ahead and comparing to what we expect from Advanced Act and DESI to sort of the state of the art at the time when I wrote this proposal five years ago um, would be the Bahamas simulations with bracketing simulations of viable physics, um, cosmo uh, AGN feedback physics, subgrid models. Um, and you can see, you know, we should, given Advanced Act is, is now complete and DESI is now on the sky, we should be able to make these measurements um, and rule out sort of these bracketing models that are allowed. Um, this was a, uh, something that uh, Marcelo and Colin worked on with Gill, showing you what uh, S4 would do. Um, but I'm going to skip ahead and talk about work that my graduate student did, because I thought this was really nice. So what uh, Emily did was she went and took camels, which is a simulation that actually had a really neat idea of varying these feedback models and making a whole sort of Latin hypercube of these various feedback parameters to see what it actually does, like how important are these feedback parameters, do an actual study, and maybe you can learn something on it. And it's actually designed to do some machine learning. Um, so what Emily did was she took these various simulations, constructed profiles, came up with a nice emulator that would then be able to you know, smoothly tell you what the kinetic SC and thermal SC pr uh, profiles would look like in, you know, forward modeled all the way through to our observations using this, 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 this MOPSI pipeline that Stefania developed, right? And so we now have something where we can take things like derivatives, make Fisher forecasts compared to observations to see how well we can actually constrain these subgrid feedback parameters going forward. So this is showing you the constraints that Emily came up with. You can see in some cases we do very well constraining things like AG, uh, supernova feedback or AGN feedback, depending on the different simulations. This is illustrious. This is the Simba simulations here, right? So some of them you're getting sub 10% constraints on what these actual properties are, what these you know, subgrid parameters are. So we can actually turn it around and use this to calibrate our simulations going forward or the future simulations going forward. And so this is forecast for ESO and DESI. Um, so that's, you know, three or four years from now, we should be able to do something like this, turn this around. Can you say what, each on the, what is each variable? A, like the supernova and AGM? Uh, one of them is like the, 
let's see. So ASN1 is like the, the loading property of these winds. So these are supernova winds. The other one's like the efficiency of those winds. Um, for the AGN, it's like the amplitude of energy injected in one. The other one's like the efficiency of energy injected in the other one. These are, and they, they vary between the two simulations to exactly how these models are, how these subgrid models couple to the, to the baryons. But it's, those are roughly like efficiency and amplitude is one way to think about them. Yeah. But how do you distinguish them? I mean, is it, is it that the AGN is centralized and the star formation is? They do actually different things on different mass scales as well. But yeah, so the, if I had a derivative plot that I think Gil would really like, because he'd probably say that's a plot that I would make. Um, <laughs> that shows how these, how these change the, you can kind of see it here. So this is particularly for AGN1, but yeah, we have all these plots for these different, and so they actually, they have different shape dependencies. Uh, and some of them will change uh, at, at larger radii and less at smaller radii. So there's, there's, it's not just all moving things up and down in terms of their amplitudes. Um, and lastly, I thought I'd finish with some preliminary results. So we, I said, you know, we can do this. I'm, we, we are doing this. So this is an example of what you know, stacking on CMAS galaxies um, with, with our, you know, previously public YMAP would look like. And now we've gone and said, well, DESI has much more galaxies, about a factor of eight times more galaxies in a given area than CMAS. So this is what the DESI LRGs look like compared to what a sub, this is a, a subsample of DESI LRGs at the CMAS rate. So it's like to like, so we're not changing masses here. And you can just see in the maps the different noise levels between CMAS and, and DESI. And this is just your square root n, one over square root n factor here in your stack, right? The map's exactly the same. So this isn't even our latest map. This is an old map published four years ago. Um, so you can just see the difference um, between the two. Uh, in, in, the actual, uh, in the actual stack. Wait, there's more sort of, you're saying it's the, the sheer space, space selection is the same between left and right, but there's just more of them? In the exactly, area. yeah. So this is a subsample of this yeah. with eight, eight times less. Because we wanted to keep, if we did CMAS, the, 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 the masses aren't exactly the same, and that actually matters for the thermal SC, as, as, as I mentioned. Um, so, so this, is, this is really promising. This is work led by uh, Chad Popik, who's a graduate student who just started working with me. Uh, and one of the things we looked at, too, is you know, do we still see that dust if we don't explicitly uh, you know, null out the CIB? And yeah, you do. So here's that nice little, little ring around the dust emitting center, even in these sort of large or luminous red galaxies, large red galaxies. How are you doing that exactly? What's that step? This is an, an internal linear combination, right? So you say, we have some model for what the spectrum of the CIB looks like. So let's explicitly null that out when we do this adding of maps, right? We're adding the maps in, in, a, in a weighted way. And so they're added in such a way where we can say, we've nulled the CIB. We want zero response to this CIB SID, SED. Now, that's not perfect, right? Because you can imagine the CIB SED varies slightly, but um, you can definitely see with and without the nulling, right? I mean, that, that's the actual dust in the, in the galaxy, not yeah. the background CIB that yeah, yeah. I think about. Yeah. But it's still CIB. <laughs> it's, still it's still dust emission from a galaxy in the infrared. Well, these could be a back, they're background to something. <laughs> but I guess not background to the, but yeah, they're background to the galaxies in front of them. <laughs> so uh, my time's up, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish. I'll leave you with a, with a summary here, right? I showed you sort of the power of these cross correlations with future CMB data sets, even with current CMB data sets. Uh, I've showed you how well we can constrain things like feedback processes with these various measurements and our forward modeling. And I've shown you that 
you know, potentially there's some new models needed or maybe new simulations. Maybe we need to use some more energy on these large supercomputers to uh, try and figure out what's going on, uh, especially in the, in the thermal SC and the pressure in these, uh, in these sort of 10 to the 13 solar mass halos. So thank you, and uh, I'll take questions. Question for our speaker. Um, so there's a little bit too much SC on very large scales. Is that, um, what about the SC power spectrum? Does, is this related to any of the problems with the SC power spectrum? Don't have a plot of this. Um, so uh, I would say no for this for this reason, right? So the so Gil's asking about the we can just take a CMB map, right, and do its autocorrelation. And on when you get to to really small scales, right, you should see some contribution from the thermal SC, right? And if you can do, you know, you can do various. There's various ways to get at this, right? You do a multi, multi-band analysis, and part of that component, you know, depending on the frequency you're looking at, should be the thermal SC, and so you can constrain it that way. And we've put constraints on the overall amplitude of this thermal SC power spectrum, and it appears to be lower than what the models would predict. Now, that deficit, especially at the L range that we're looking at, the scales that we're looking at, is more sensitive to higher mass things. These are more like 10 to the 14 solar mass objects at redshifts 0.5 and above. So these are, they don't contribute too much on these scales that we're, where we see this deficit of power. Um, so that's why I would say this is probably not related, but you can think about potentially doing like a holistic analysis where you start to include these other forms of thermal SC measurements that we have. There's many thermal SC measurements. There's measurements cross-correlating with like lensing. And so there's many different ways to sort of get at what is, 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 what is going on here. Is this, uh, is this something that's really in the data on these particular scales? Because I think, from my knowledge, this is the first time somebody's really isolated sort of like 10 to the 13 solar mass objects, stacked them in the SC and made a profile. Most people just do sort of one aperture, right? Where the profile, you get additional spatial information. So it's harder for things like simulations to hide certain things. If you notice back in the, I don't know why I have a Skype thing popping up. Um, so if you'll notice, there is some excess if we go to these smaller scales, right? So if you were to just do like an aperture measurement here, you could potentially everything would be fine, right? If you do an integrated measurement of what the total SC flux would be, thermal SC flux, you could potentially be, be okay. Maybe not for TNG, but um, so there are ways to hide it if you don't have the spatial information. you were uh, showing us the resolution of the Atacama uh, telescope, the many other um, objects were popping up as points. I wanted to ask if uh, you're also, you or other people are also using that to look at asteroids. And uh, if you are, then I'd be interested to know some of the results that you get. Um, so, so those weren't asteroids that were popping up. Those were, those were dusty star forming galaxies. But yeah, it turns out. Yes, I am. Sorry? Carry on. Carry on? Uh, it turns out uh, CMB experiments are very sensitive thermometers. Um, and you can see asteroids in the Rayleigh genes tail. Uh, and being in the Atacama, we have, you know, we get to look at the ecliptic, where a lot of them live, um, or reside, I should say. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we are looking at asteroids, <laughs> short answer. Uh, and we have light curves of, you know, some of the the bigger asteroids. Um, we have measurements at 90, 150, 220 gigahertz for these asteroids. We're looking at various flux deficits and things like that. And comparisons, to, and we're comparing to models from that are designed to match sort of the IR where they peak, right, in their thermal emission. Uh, 
I actually uh, heard in some other talk uh, they were using the South Pole uh, telescope for that, uh, and then uh, they said that the, uh, the the radiation measured from the asteroid is kind of lower than expected or something like that. And yeah, yeah, so we see a deficit as well. Ours is much more significant because we get bigger asteroids. We see them for longer. We can stack longer. Um, but we were still finalizing things. We want to make sure the calibration and everything's correct. If you're going to make a statement like that, we want to we want to be sure. But um, there will be a student presenting some work on this at the AAS uh, in January. Okay. Well, but hopefully, we'll have our paper out before then. Why do you think that happens? Is it because things are empty inside, or I am a cosmologist, not a geologist. Um, <laughs> But I can say, I can go like the I, regolith. Do, do we understand what, you know, maybe these asteroids are covered. So we, we're seeing, you know, we, we get a lot of information in the IR, right? Which is, ba you know, basically telling us roughly what's happening on the surface. But these asteroids are probably, you know, dusty. Maybe there's some dust film on top of them. So we don't necessarily know what's happening a couple millimeters below that dust. And that's exactly what we're probing. Right with this, with these measurements in the in the millimeter, so you know maybe we can say something about the composition. Maybe what we'll do is put it out there and let people who care about things like regolith uh, come up with various models to try and explain what we're seeing. Because I I couldn't I couldn't come up with a model for rocks. No, I didn't. Thank you. Um, I have a question on your CIB donut plot. So, so the bottom left, that's, that's a map of dust, or that's not Compton Y, that's not This is the Compton Y map. But this is a Compton Y map. But without projecting out Without dust. projecting out the CIB. Without projecting out, please stop saying CIB, dust. Dust. <laughs> dust emission. Without projecting out dust emission. Um, but, that, so that, but that's telling you where the dust emission is, right? Uh, part of it, yeah, it's, you know, but it, so it, it, this is only designed to pick up the thermal SD decrement, but some, there's some leakage of dust into that estimator, so that's decreasing the amount of, because it's, at, you know, it's, here you, you would oh, potentially okay. see that, yeah, yeah, yeah so it's, it's not, okay, but you could make it into a dust map, right? You could do the same thing you can say instead of making a Compton Y map, you could make a CIB or dust map, and you can do the same. And you could you could potentially look at dust in these galaxies. Sure, yeah, that's something you could do. It's in the halo. It's in the halo. In the halo, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, that's interesting. People do that on like with individual galaxies. <laughs> it's stupid. It's the way to do it. Yeah, I think some people have stacked looking for dust. Yeah. Just, I, I'm surprised you haven't done it. We don't have good samples. It's spectroscopy in the sound. Do you need spectroscopy to do this? You don't need spectroscopy. You just need, you can do this with, with DES. Uh, you, you want spectroscopy. You just need to know what sample you're looking at. Yeah. The thing you'd want to do is this map this out versus redshift. Then you're doing CID. Yeah, I guess so. Because you'd want to find out where, like the dust is tracing the star formation, so then you can trace out where the star formation is happening. Of course. So if I looked at yeah. that, I assume that that's correlated. So there's been a couple people in ACT try, who started projects on this, and they've never finished them because, I don't know, they get bored with dust. Joaquin never gets bored with dust. There is public data from ACT. You can always do it. Srini has dust maps from SPT if you want to do this. Uh, yes. Um, all right, let's thank our speaker.